We were probably a fairly traditional country family. Uh, my wife and I had five children, uh, two boys and three girls, the boys being the eldest. And it was a very happy family uh, group. But I would say this about Shane, I mean, right from the time uh, uh, he could first smile, he had a real glint in his eye, like a little bit of devilment or a little bit of personality. He talked to us about Shane and how this straight A student was starting to battle a bit in class and that he was pretty worried that he wasn't going to make it. So that was the first sign that, that something wasn't quite right. By the end of that year, um, he'd uh, failed his uh, HSC, as it was in those days, VCE today. He'd failed it dismally, never just failed, he failed it dismally. And, and uh, so he didn't want to go back to school. We tried to get him to go back and, and uh, sit again. He didn't want to do that. And it was then that we started to notice that uh, he was having a bit of a job with continuity in terms of concentration and putting his mind to a task and completing it. He had a lot of skills, but what he didn't have was he didn't have the ability to concentrate and to endure. And so he would get a job, but his concentration would wane and he would therefore start to slip and fail at the job. And if he didn't get sacked, he'd walk out. That became a very dark part of his life as well. Uh, so it was, it was a very difficult time and it was very much part of the roller coaster that was starting to unfold. His behaviour uh, at that time uh, where he would lock himself away and just feel so sad and, and so unloved and unwanted, even in a family that loved him, uh, uh, showed clear signs of, of depression, where he'd be sleep deprived and w where he wouldn't eat. You know, it was all of the classic symptoms when you look back on them um, as, uh, as depression. But his, uh, his initial diagnosis was schizophrenia and then later on uh, severe depression. We didn't know what way that would play out in Shane's life. What did it mean? You know, what were the opportunities that may or may not exist for him given this diagnosis. That created a dynamic uh, where information was very hard to find, uh, solid information was very hard to find. To be able to traffic through the network of services was impossible. And as a family, we just seemed to roll from one crisis to another. So he'd be in hospital, he'd come home, and his uh, style of living at that time was not conducive to a household of uh, two adults and five children. It just didn't work, and so that created enormous problems. It became fairly evident that, that, that Shane was going to struggle to, uh, to make his own way in life, that he was uh, to be a completely independent, free spirit was going to be uh, probably not realistic. And if, if that was the case, then who was going to pick up the responsibility? Well his parents and his family were obviously the ones that were going to pick up their responsibility. I think the more we talked about it, um, uh, the better it got. Um, I think people started to see that, that, uh, that we were not ashamed of what was happening to Shane, that, that it was a fact of life, that, that, that this thing called mental illness was in fact a, legit, a legitimate illness, even though in the past it had been treated uh, in a very different way, you know, they, they built red brick buildings, they put them on a hill outside of the town, not in the town, so that they isolated the people. So we've got this dreadful legacy and this dreadful stigma that we've got to try and deal with. But I think the more you talk about it, uh, the better that became. And uh, yes, we did have a bit of a battle with some people, but our family and friends, we talked about it openly with them. We, we, we never concealed anything, whether it was in their home or in our home or whether it was over a barbie or wherever it was. We talked about it, uh, about the challenges that Shane faced uh, and how he was dealing with them and, and many times how they played out, what his, what his behaviour was as a consequence of that. The more you did that, the more, people, the more you normalise it, if that's the right word, that people see it as this is somebody that's got a challenge in life and this is how they deal with it. That was sort of our approach, and, and, and Shane, to his great credit, supported that approach as well. I mean, he, he never hid from it. He, he knew that he, something had hold of him that was bigger than him, and, uh, and he would have loved to have found something to, to help him get over it. Never happened, unfortunately. The 
the shock that we as a family suffered with Shane's death, even though, as I've said, we sort of anticipated something would happen, was just soul-destroying. And uh, it's just the worst possible thing you could ever have happen to any individual or particularly any family. Uh, it's just it's soul-destroying. Uh, immediately uh, after Shane's death, the community uh, rallied and came to our home and uh, showed their support uh, in those intervening days immediately after his death and then after the funeral they still continued to support in, a, in an understanding way, bearing in mind that this is now 16 years ago. I think it was an outstanding response given the, the sort of knowledge that was available, available then versus the knowledge that's available now. Well, I mean, Shane's story is tragic. Uh, after many years of treatment and not getting the right medication, he unfortunately lost his life. But Shane's elder brother, Darren, um, about three years after Shane was first diagnosed, Darren was diagnosed as well. So he went through a range of challenges, a little bit similar to Shane uh, in lots of ways. But eventually, uh, Darren was put onto a medication that's readily available today, much, much after Shane had had died. Um, that has just been an outstanding result for Darren. He's back living independently. He works as a private in-home carer to intellectually disabled young adults, a very challenging profession, and does it very well and loves the work and uh, got his own car and, and leads his own individual life as a great social network. And it's just a good news story. So. We've got both sides in the McGrath family. You know, we've got the sad story of Shane, but we've got the great story of hope from Darren that given the right medication, given the right sort of treatments, given the right sort of family supports and encouragement, and particularly community support, great result. Since Beyond Blue's come on board, there's been an enormous change in the way people view depression and anxiety and mental illness generally in the community. An enormous change, um, to the point where people no longer cringe. People no longer uh, want to sweep it under the carpet. People want to talk about it. And people say to you, you know, that badge in your coat, isn't that Beyond Blue? My brother got help through Beyond Blue, or my auntie got help through Beyond Blue. This is over a counter in a shop. Would never have happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So. We are progressing, uh, and there are several reasons we could go into for that, but by and large, Beyond Blue has normalised discussion about depression and anxiety, and as a consequence, mental illness generally, so that people feel comfortable. That's an enormous advancement, enormous advancement. And what that does, of course, is it provides a segue for people who experience these conditions to actually not feel threatened, but in fact feel like, I think I'll reach out for help. And that is just so important.